In 2017, we made the decision to actively start fundraising as an organization. So um, historically, we've always accepted contributions to Lifeline of Ohio, but never really actively did any fundraising. And when we made that decision, we did see a pretty significant decrease in our overall participation, even though fundraising wasn't required of our participants. But for us, the trade-off was worth it because now we do have a, a slightly smaller group, although we're around 2,500 participants and we still have continued to grow every year since we made that transition, we continue to grow back up. We just, we have now like an actively engaged group of participants and individuals that you know, want to support our mission and want to support the work that we do and, you know, where the funds go and, and all of that. Welcome to Fundraising Events. During each episode, we will chat with an influencer in the event industry who has been instrumental in helping nonprofits raise more funds. Our goal is to share helpful tips, tricks, and stories that will empower you to raise more with your future events. Now a little bit about our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Give Sign Up, Run Sign Up, your fundraising event technology experts. Next time you have a fundraising event, try Give Sign Up, Run Sign Up. Whether it's a run, walk, ride, golf tournament, gala, or fundraising campaign, raise more, save time easily with the Give Sign Up, Run Sign Up purpose-built supporter engagement platform. Get started for free today at givesignup.org. I'm Brian Jenkins, and I'm joined today by Julie Kunzelman. Welcome to fundraising events, Julie. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I love the background. Um, Thank you. So, <laughs> you know, just a shameless post there. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like it. We haven't had anybody do a background yet, so I'm actually kind of excited. Oh, good. Oh, I'm glad I can be the first. <laughs> so um, the best way to always start is um, maybe let's talk a little bit about um, Lifeline Ohio. Yeah. And then we can talk a little bit about you. So let's talk sure. a little bit about Lifeline Ohio first. <clears throat> yeah. So Lifeline of Ohio, uh, we're a nonprofit organization and we're based in Columbus, Ohio. And we um, help facilitate the organ eye and tissue donation process in the central and southeastern Ohio area. So um, for individuals that have registered on their driver's license to be an organ eye and tissue donor have made that decision. And at the time of, of their death, we work with their family and the hospitals to um, recover organs and tissues to be transplanted in individuals who are in need of one. Um, and sometimes that can be life-saving in the case of organs, um, sometimes healing in the case of tissue and, um, well, really actually sometimes life-saving in the case of tissue and corneas as well. Um, and it's really amazing. Recipients get a second chance at life and it's all made possible by the generosity of a donor. Yeah. And, and I think you are greatly simplifying what you guys do. There's oh yeah, of- absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And we appreciate that. But um, if you think it's that simple, it's definitely not. Um, yeah, yeah. But- so yeah, it is a, um, you know, a, yeah, quite a, a complicated process and a really important one um, in the hospitals with our, you know, hospital partners and families that make that decision, um, you know, whose loved ones go on to be a donor. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing. Truly. Yeah, no, yeah. It, 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 and it's kind of a, a revolution of science that we can even have those conversations. Yeah, um, Absolutely. Yeah. So maybe let's talk a little about about you and your role within Lifeline Ohio. Yeah. So um, I am the events and volunteer supervisor and actually going on actually this July will be uh, eight years with the organization. So I uh, plan all of our internal and external events, uh, as well as uh, help lead and manage our volunteers and our volunteer program and um, lots of other stuff in between. So. Yeah. How many volunteers are you typically coordinating? Uh, we have about an, an active uh, group of about 450 volunteers. So we have quite wow. the volunteer force and, and they're all over. So like I said, we cover central and southeastern Ohio and they're really they're all over uh, what we call our service area. And it's all of the counties that that we serve within the state. Um, it's 38 in um, in Ohio and actually two in West Virginia. So, um, yeah, we have, uh, I guess, quite like the army of individuals who are out there, um, you know, that have connections to donation um, and want to share about, you know, their loved one who was a donor or their second chance at life or um, even living donors um, or even really just people that believe in the cause that just, you know, support the mission and, you know, want to spread the message about the importance of being a registered organized tissue donor. Yeah. So. Yeah. Let's talk about your premier event 
um, yeah cash for donation so let's let's start with that i mean you've been involved with it for quite a while so you know the full story there yeah so the dash is um is the dash for donation is lifeline of ohio's annual 5k it's a run walk um and a family fun walk and um, it raises awareness for organ eye and tissue donation and and uh, i guess a little bit of, of the history too um it's this is the 22nd annual event so this will be like i said i'm only going on eight years so there's a, a, a larger history of of you know even before i was here um but it's held each year in downtown columbus um, and virtually now, okay. um, and it's typically the second weekend in July. Um, and it's this year, it's an eight day event. It will start July 10th through July 17th. And actually this year we've reduced the registration to $8 and 75 cents, which signifies the number of lives um, one organ donor can save, which is eight and one tissue donor can heal, which is 75. Wow. Yeah. That's a good, that's a, that's a really good marketing number. Yeah. And, you know, for us, um, you know, uh, for us, there are far less overhead costs to doing a virtual event. Um, but and so we know that, that like that in person aspect is, is really missing. And so we want to, you know, first of all, it's, you know, a, a cool thing to have it signify what it does. Um, but also, um, you know, we just wanted to in keep people engaged in our event because a virtual event is you know, clearly not the same as an in-person race that, you know, everybody's used to and being able to see friends and family and people gathering and, you know, come to race and, you know, do all the things that you normally do and enjoy in a, uh, an in-person event. We thought by, you know, reducing the rate for, you know, these past couple of years for virtual events would be um, just a great way to people keep people engaged. And it's cool that we can, it can signify what it does. So, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, kind of the history of the dash and kind of when um it hit its largest participation numbers yeah so like i said um it's this is the 22nd annual event and at its peak it was at a uh, more than 4000 individuals just over 4000 individuals um and it really has taken many forms over the years i know i sort of explained to you a little bit before that uh at one point this event was i think there was a triathlon involved mm -hmm. there was even a half marathon aspect and oddly even a rollerblading event at one point in time oh, wow. yeah so we just stick to the basics now of a 5k and a family fun walk but yeah it really has taken um many forms over the years and it started out with just a couple hundred people and then we've just continued to um, you know, for a while continued to increase, um, you know, year after year um, until it hit its peak um, at over just over 4,000 participants. That's amazing. Um, so one of the things that we did in our kind of our uh, pre discussion is um, we talked about, uh, you know, this, this event becoming 4,000 people and mm -hmm. uh, you as an as a group making it a, a decision to transition the event in a little bit different direction yeah so let's talk a little bit about that transition yeah so in 2017 uh as an organization we made the decision to um actively start fundraising as an organization so um historically we've always accepted contributions uh to, to lifeline of ohio but never really actively did any fundraising um and really our only ask of the public ever was to be a registered organizing tissue donor um but we always did accept contributions um and obviously that's always still our main goal is to you know register more donors in the ohio donor registry but we also actively fundraise now too um, and when we made that decision, again, in 2017, uh, the Dash is our largest fundraiser, um, and that we did see a pretty significant decrease in our overall participation, uh, even though fundraising wasn't required of our participants. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, the trade-off was worth it, uh, because now we do have a, a slightly smaller group, um, and although it's we're around 2500 participants and we still have continued to grow every year since we made that transition we've continued to grow back up um we just we have now like an actively engaged group of participants and individuals that you know want to support our mission and want to support the work that we do and you know where the funds go and and all of that so 
uh, yeah, I mean, it really did af affect us. And there were a number of other changes that happened that same year that, you know, potentially affected, you know, our, our overall numbers. But I, I think fundraising being uh, the biggest change that we made that we heard from people uh, that, you know, they weren't interested in doing that, which, which is okay. Yeah. So you, you talked about that you as a group met. So what was the um, kind of driving factor that drove you to make that transition? Yeah. So uh, there was a couple of different things, but I think our, our, our main thing is um, with additional fundraising dollars, our organization can do a lot more um, educational and um, to support our donor families and to, you know, to, to help them honor their heroes of donation and their loved ones, you know, that went on to be donors. So again, the Dash is our largest fundraiser and um, primarily those dollars go to support our donor families and our aftercare and bereavement department and services that we provide. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a two year um, program that we provide to our donor families and uh, um, aftercare program that we provide to them with grief resources and events and support materials that help them uh, after they've lost a loved one. Um, but then also the fundraising dollars go towards uh, providing education in the public about organ and tissue donations. So with those funds, we can just we can do more. Uh, we can have, we can be more places in the community, provide more education in different ways, uh, and we can have more events and, and, you know, again, more things to, you know, support our donor families. Yeah. And so one of the things is I've, I've explored other people uh, who have, you know, trying to understand the value of their events. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that's become kind of clear to me is, you know, getting an event of 4,000 people, first of all, is very challenging and, yeah. and and you're getting into a very elite company at that point sure and so some of the th the balancing acts that you're doing is um you know having high participation does that actually mean you have high awareness right lower participation and higher fundraising but maybe you lose some of that awareness sure was that kind of tossed around in the group of like do you feel like the event was actually generating awareness for your organization so um, yes and no. I mean, yeah. It, it, historically, it started out that our event, you know, really was strictly an awareness event, and and it really still is in the community because, again, fundraising is not required, and so we yeah. have lots of people who participate in our event that are interested in you know just participating in a local race. So we still have that, and from that perspective, it is still an awareness event. Um, but it it is also an event you know, to that point that serves our families and the people that are actively engaged with us um, as an engagement opportunity, which in turn creates awareness because, you know, people come to our events and, you know, they see that it's, you know, an exciting event and they're happy to be there and we, you know, make people feel good and they see people. And so that in turn can be an awareness opportunity because then people are, you know, talking about it and posting about it and things like that. So, um, so that helps from that perspective that we have a really actively engaged group of, of people who participate in our event. Um, but I think the big transition, um, you know, to your point that we saw was we, we probably lost a lot of people who were participating in our, and again, this is an assumption, I don't know this, but um, lost a lot of people who were participating in our event that weren't committed or um, there because of the cause. They were there just because it was a local race. And because we made that transition, yeah, the awareness for them was, you know, I'm not in, interested in fundraising. So I'm, you know, I'll find another race to participate in. Again, that's an assumption just based on. Sure. Yeah. So. Well, that's good. I, I'm, I'm, I appreciate you sharing that because I don't yeah. think that trade off has been discussed a lot. And I think there's, um, you know, and, and the other thing that is important is even though you didn't make fundraising required or even, you know, kind of make people do it. It's just, there was, there is some of that perception that goes on. Sure. It's important to recognize that too. Mm -hmm. um, but now you guys are kind of through the other side of that. Yeah. And our approach is we're trying to have like a really um, grassroots uh, approach to fundraising. Um, you know, again, it's still not required. We don't really have minimums, although we encourage people to raise uh, a certain amount of money. Um, we're kind of, you know, trialing that this year of, of encouraging through incentives to, you know, at least have 
set a goal and to meet their goal, whatever that goal is. Um, and so we're, you know, we're, we're, like I said, just trying to take a really grassroots um, approach to, um, to the fundraising side of it, because it is a big change, you know, to go, you know, 18 ish years without it being a fundraising event. And to make that transition, we realize that's a big leap to take. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, so one of the other things that I think you guys do really well that I wanted to talk about is kind of your, your team competition. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, over the past couple of years, uh, you know, since starting the fundraising, we've tried to um, really develop some competition among the teams. And there's always been naturally a little bit with people who know each other of like, who can I, you know, who's going to have the biggest team and, Mm -hmm. you know, all of that. Um, But we've tried to develop some um, like incentives and, you know, spirit awards um, amongst our teams. And um, so we have one that's for the largest team, the most spirited individual, um, the most uh, spirited pet, and uh, a couple of other things, you know, highest fundraising team, highest fundraising individual, um, that kind of thing. And then we offer prizes um, for the groups or the individuals who, um, or I guess the team captains and the individuals who kind of you know, fit those categories or, or win the awards. Um, and I think that creates a little bit of competition amongst the teams. Um, and then last year we did um, a special or kind of a separate incentive for the highest fundraising team, again, to drive those uh, fundraising dollars, um, you know, because people are interested in fundraising, um, and, you know, and you just provide a, a little bit of a, you know, incentive or a prize to do that. And, you know, the competition really does come out. So it was, it's really been quite amazing to see. So. Yeah. And one of the other things you guys provide is a, is a toolkit. Can Mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about that toolkit? Yeah. So, um, again, for the past several years, I'm trying to remember how, how long we've done the toolkit. Um, when we started fundraising, I think pretty much is when we developed the toolkit, we wanted to offer participants or provide them with information and resources on how to grow their team, how to grow their fundraising and their fun, you know, host fundraising events and things like that. So we wanted to help our teams and our participants with these things. So we provide a toolkit that has information and resources on how to do some of those things. Um, We even have as part of it, like a social media toolkit. So it has sample, um, posts and graphics, kind of mm-hmm. like this one right here. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, shameless plug, um, you know, in, in there, and we have posters that people can use to advertise, you know, in their communities and in, you know, local centers and things like that. Um, and it's been really fun for us to create and to find creative ways to, you know, share with our teams and our captains and our participants. Um, but then also a really good resource for everybody to use as well. So yeah, I, I love that. Um, it's something I have seen um, in other team focused events. Yeah. Is um, and, and in other words, they're sometimes called ambassadors. Like if you think of team captains as, in, as sure. ambassadors. Yeah. Um, everything you can do. And, and I've even worked with this one event where they actually sat down the team captains and did like a luncheon, mm-hmm. and did a training session with the toolkit. Yeah. Helping people get their fundraising team page set up, um, helping people get their branding set up for their email or getting their social media stuff set up. Yeah. And, and the butterfly effects on that stuff is amazing. Yeah. That's... Because they're willing to come to a lunch, right? Sure. They're going to invest two hours with you. And then right. they also know, you know, hey, I need to call Julie up because um, one of my team members is, is saying they're having some difficulty. Okay. Mm-hmm. Julie gets on the phone. Turns out it's no big deal. Yeah, we're excited. And and you just kind of move that along. And these teams, you know, I've seen many, many teams get over 100 people. Yeah, when you when you put these types of systems in place, and they have multi year values. So it's like, you can't just look at it as one year, like that team may come back for five years or more. Right, right. right. Um, so yeah, I, I love that. And and so um, what is your website so that people could check that out? Yeah, it's uh, dash for donation.org. Okay, great. So I, we will include a link to that in the um, show description. And I would highly recommend people going there and yeah. looking at the toolkit and to use that as potentially a, um, a, a template of success there. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And yeah, it, it, it has been um, really great for us. And um, like I said, and people have been engaged and, you know, interested in participating and in, in all the different things. And we really have learned a lot over these past couple of years being a virtual uh, event. Sure. You know, 
we hope to be back in person. Um, and I think we will in 2022, um, you know, but then moving on to sort of a hybrid event. So it'll be interesting to see sort of how things transition over the next couple of years. But yeah, that the toolkit is definitely one thing that we'll continue to do and provide as a resource to our participants. So great. So we're getting to the part of the podcast that's a little less structured. Um, yeah. We call it the teardown because nobody likes to show up when it's time to clean up. <laughs> so um, what is the best piece of advice you've received in regards to events? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I, I think the thing that works for us, uh, and especially because of the type of race that, you know, that we host, it being a nonprofit and, you know, engaging our community of, of families and, you know, recipients and recipient families and things like that. I think the biggest thing for us is um, the customer service really is, is just doing everything we can to help support and um, provide resources and information to our participants as little or as large as it may be. Um, you know, just like, Hey, I'm having trouble logging in, or I'm having trouble doing this. Um, and, 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 it works for us because we try to be as helpful as we can, because at the end of the day, it, you know, helps make us more successful because again, if people stay engaged because they're, you know, a simple thing that they couldn't mm -hmm. figure out, you know, it's the customer service, I think for us. So what is the funniest thing you've seen in an event? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> And Lots I'll of different you, things. I'll give you a hint that others have taken, although I may be putting you down a path. Many people have commented about costumes at events. Okay, so yeah, that's kind of where I was going. We've had, we, we do have a lot of costumes, but probably the funniest thing I've seen in recent years, um, oh gosh, and I wish I had a picture prepared, um, <laughs> was a dog which we don't actually allow pets at our event just because as large as it is, it gets a little bit difficult with pets, but a woman brought a dog to our event, uh, not last year, I guess it would have been in 2019. It was this little tiny, maybe Pomeranian and had sunglasses and like this little suit on. Um, and it was, oh gosh, the hottest day. So it had to have been probably miserable for that dog, but it was quite comical. <laughs> And right now is when I, sh when I wish I could change my background to a picture of that picture. dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we haven't had anybody mention any pets yet. Yeah, uh, it was, it had like blue sunglasses. It was, it was pretty funny. <laughs> so now that we're um, slowly making our way out of the pandemic, um, many people that work at events um, have an event that they personally enjoy. It could be a concert. It could be, uh, you know, a vacation spot or w w what type of event are you looking forward to attending again? Oh gosh, event. Um, I mean, for me, just even just going out day to day, like going out to dinner is, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, and some of that you could do during the pandemic a little bit, but for me, that's, I, you know, just being out and being social and, you know, spending time outdoors and yeah, I mean, certainly a vacation. Um, I, I, I told you before I have two kids. And so as a family, we, you know, haven't been on a vacation as a family of four. Um, and, you know, really as a, you know, haven't really done a, a nice vacation or really any sort of vacation in, you know, 14 months, probably just like the rest of the world. So uh, yeah. looking forward to doing that. And um, yeah. And probably in addition to that concerts, you know, you have a favorite. Artist. Was, oh gosh. Um, I mean, I like a, a lot of music, but uh, last year we were, I was actually supposed to go to the Billy Joel concert, okay. uh, with my mom and my sister. So, um, luckily it's been, uh, rescheduled. For, well, actually, yeah, it's been rescheduled for this fall. So I'll be excited this September. So I'm excited to, to go to that. That's the first one on the books at least. Good. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you sharing um, everything you've shared today. I definitely got a different perspective on that that discussion about changing, you know, your event that was clearly very successful into something that's a little bit more aligned with those fundraising goals. Um, I really appreciate you sharing that um, yeah. with, with me and, and hopefully others will find it helpful as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks again for having me and happy to share. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm.